Hi, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us again as we continue Heart Month here at Heart Engine Medical Center. Um, we are very excited for today's doc talk. Um, this is a new physician to the South Heart Clinic group and a new physician to Heart Engine Medical Center. It's going to be his first doc talk here with us. Um, so we are very excited for that. Before we get started, though, before I introduce him, just a reminder that we have one more doc talk for Heart Month next week with Dr. Yardby. He'll be speaking on updates in cardiology next Thursday at 5.30 p.m., um, same place out here at, at Heart Engine Medical Center. So please feel free to call to RCP if you have not. Um, if you called into the number, I do. we do receive the messages, and so if you do need a call back, just let us know and we'll give you a, a call. But next week, Doc, Dr. Yardi will be speaking. Um, and then another event that we have the flyers up here at the front if you'd like to take one. Uh, we are participating in the Heart Engine Save a Life event. And so at this event, they're going to be doing CPR training, um, hands-on CPR training. They're going to be doing Stop the Bleed uh, training. They're going to be doing active shooter training. A bunch of different things that we do need here in the community. For just, just knowledge for our community to know it's a free event. And we're actually partnering with a lot of different um, organizations to host this free event for the community. So if you would like to attend, it's going to be on Saturday, February 22nd from 8 to 12. And that's other upcoming events here that we're having. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Michael Valderas, a native of the Rio Grande Valley, obtained his medical degree from Ross University School of Medicine in 2011. He then chose to return to the Valley and completed his internal medicine internship and residency at UTHS CSARAHC under the direction of James Hanley, MD. During his internship year, Dr. Valderas was voted Outstanding Intern of the Year and the UTH um, SCSA Medicine Clerkship Intern of the Year. In his final year of residency, Dr. Valderas was also voted Outstanding Resident of the Year and awarded the prestigious Kleber Foundation Research Grant. He then completed a cardiology fellowship under the direction of John Erickson, Dr. John Erickson, where Dr. Valderas was again voted Outstanding Fellow of the Year in 2015 to 2016 and given the title of Chief Fellow for the 27-2018 academic year. He then completed an Interventional Cardiology Fellowship under the direction of Dr. Stephen Bailey. Dr. Valderas is well versed in all aspects of general cardiology and interventional cardiology, including coronary and peripheral interventions. Additionally, he has extensive experience in structural cardiology and has participated in numerous TAVRs, PFO, and VSD closures. So if you can please help me welcome Dr. Michael Valderas. That was quite an introduction, thank you so much. <laughs> when you think about it, in retrospect, it was a long time, seven years of training, you think you would know something by now, but every day you learn, every day. Today, we're gonna to focus on something that is near and dear to me, obesity in the heart. You may ask why. Well, in the valley, um, actually just recently, um, my wife told me two days ago that Brownsville was voted number one. And I was like, wow, number one for what? She's like, it was the fattest city in the United States. And I was like, man, you always wanna be number one, but not when it comes to that. It's, it, was, it was a little disturbing, to say the least, but it makes sense. And, I was, and she asked me, what are you gonna talk about? I was like, you know what, I, I wanna focus on something that is near and dear to my heart because a majority of these patients are gonna come to see me at some point or another. So, obesity in the heart. When we talk about obesity, we talk about a national epidemic. It's, um, it affects numerous people. They state that 1.9 billion adults are considered overweight. That's a lot of people. Um, 650 million are considered obese. When we say obese, it means that their BMI, BMI, body mass index, is greater than 30. The unfortunate thing is that it's also affecting children. Children are commonly afflicted with childhood obesity. And as children, if they're obese, it's gonna be very hard for them to grow out of it as they get older. So it becomes a conundrum. Um, and it's very difficult to break. 
out of this app. Um, when we, I don't know if you can clearly see this, but the problem with obesity is that it leads to numerous complications. Um, top, starting from the top, patients are at risk for stroke. Why? Because when you're obese, it increases your blood pressure. With the increase in blood pressure, you risk rupture of these blood vessels up there, and it leads, to, it can lead to a stroke. As we go down further into the body, into the lungs, we worry about patients with sleep apnea. Typically, they're obese. Why? When we have a lot of fat tissue in this chest, uh, chest area, it tends to compress our trachea, and it louder. Yes. Oh my bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize for that. So, okay, I was referencing sleep apnea and how when we're obese, it. No, that's what it was. That's what it was. When we're obese, we, it leads to a lot of excess tissue and weight in our chest cavity. It tends to compress our trachea, and it affects us as we sleep at night. Um, it leads to episodes where we don't breathe, and that is termed as apnea. Um, it, of course, leads to heart disease, which we're going to focus on momentarily. But I'm going to bypass that and go down to the liver. It leads to fatty liver disease and the potential development of liver cirrhosis. As we go down, it increases our, I'm oh, sorry, that's what I was referencing right there. That's the liver. <coughs> liver cirrhosis leads to hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a type of cancer. As we go down further, skin fold rashes. Well, when we're obese, we tend to kind of lose some of that tissue. Why? Because we have folds that go over the tissue underneath, and we develop infections underneath these folds. Patients who are obese tend to develop fungal infections and bacterial infections of the skin. Going down even further, it can affect the gallbladder. You can get gallstones um, leading to what's called um, cholecystitis, an infection of the gallbladder, requiring oftentimes a removal of the gallbladder. As we go downwards, it can lead to, of course, diabetes, which is very rampant down here. The problem is when we become a little bit obese, what will happen is that it decreases the, the way the body responds to insulin, okay? If we develop what's called insulin resistance. As time goes on, we can get the glucose inside of our bodies, and the glucose in our body tends to damage the internal lining of our arteries. That's where the cardiologist typically get involved in the mainframe of diabetes. So further downwards, it can lead to infertility. Unfortunately, uh, obese patients tend to be infertile because of a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome. Does it happen to everybody? No, but it's a fairly rapid process. And of course, as we go down, it can weaken our muscles and our bones. It can specifically weaken the joints, um, leading to osteoarthritis and eventually debilitating um, many patients, and some of them oftentimes are not, will require replacement of joints. Okay. Now, when I referenced uh, obesity, I referenced diabetes because they go hand in hand. The more obese we are, the higher we are at risk for developing diabetes. It's an unfortunate conundrum. It falls in parallel with each other. Um, this marker right here, this body mass index, illustrates that the higher our body mass index, the higher the adjusted risk of developing diabetes. That's pretty, that's pretty specific and it's worrisome. When we talk about obesity, specifically the heart, we worry about a couple of different things. Specifically, these entities. One, we'll start at the very top, called endothelial dysfunction. What that means is that it causes damage to the internal parts of the arteries, okay, and it causes them to become dysfunctional. The next part is atherogenic dyslipidemia. Fancy word for saying that cholesterol builds up inside of the arterial walls. Inflammatory profile. Well, when we're obese, for some odd reason, we have a lot of what's called inflammatory markers that are elevated. The association hasn't been identified. We just know that it happens. When we have all these markers that are high, they tend to also damage the internal portions of our arteries. People always wonder why 
cardiologists are so busy during the winter months. You know, people are afflicted with the flu. It shouldn't affect the heart, right? It's wrong. The number one killer of patients who have had a heart attack afterwards is influenza or a pneumonia. When that happens, your body kind of goes crazy. It's trying to fight this infection. And when it's, it's sending all these inflammatory markers, well, the inflammatory markers aren't that smart. And they tend to attack everything, including the internal portions of the walls, of our blood vessels in our heart. When that happens, it can break back off and it can lead to heart attacks. It's not uncommon to see a patient who comes in with the flu have a big heart attack. Actually, saw one last night. Exact same phenomenon. He had the flu, flu B. Um, he was having a massive heart attack. So it is very common. That's why after you typically have a big heart attack, we typically recommend getting your flu vaccine on a yearly basis. A pro-thrombotic state. Well, when we're a little bit on the heavier side, we tend to uh, cause what's called stasis of blood flow. Stasis of blood flow means blood flow is not moving very well. When blood kind of pools in a certain area, it tends to form clots. Hence, prothrombotic state. We referenced insulin resistance. That's saying that as we get bigger, our tissues become less responsive to insulin. And that glucose that was supposed to go inside of our cells is found outside inside of the arteries and that's what damages the um, the internal portions of our arteries and of course obesity goes hand in hand with hypertension um, specifically going back to the previous slide the more obese we are the higher we are for atherosclerosis a greek word indicating hardening of the internal portions of our arteries typically built up of what is called cholesterol, lipids, and calcium. Why? People who tend to be obese tend to not follow a very good diet. Diets that are fat in saturated fats, sugars, carbohydrates can damage the internal portions of the vessels. This is a, actually an interesting uh, slide, abdominal obesity. For some odd reason, Patients who are chubbier from this area to this area are at an increased risk for developing heart disease. Why? That's a great question. I'm not sure. We just know that it happens. Um, they typically assess the abdominal fat and determine, hey, you know what? You probably need to get on a diet. Why? Because the risk of developing heart disease is significantly higher in Obesity also increases the risk of developing what's called heart failure, where your heart doesn't pump like it normally should. Um, it could be what's called, you could develop what's called a dilated cardiomyopathy and resulting systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction. Um, this obesity can also lead, of course, to atherosclerosis, which over time can lead to systolic dysfunction. Long story short, the chubbier we are, the higher the risk for developing heart failure. This one is also kind of scary. Why? Because obesity increases our risk of death, specifically from heart disease. The factors that I spoke about earlier, atherosclerosis, heart failure, those are all um, entities that increase our risk of death. So it goes hand in hand. It's more prominent, unfortunately, in men, but and they are typically more afflicted with heart disease. Um, this one was a little bit worrisome. Whenever we're, uh, we tend to be a little bit bigger, we tend to develop what's called malignant arrhythmias. Malignant arrhythmias means that your heart is not beating like it normally should. And when we have some of these malignant arrhythmias, um, our heart, in essence, stops. And we tend, they, they die, in essence, so sudden cardiac death. So, after I scared you, you know, everybody's worried now. How do we avoid these things? Well, oftentimes there's multiple modifiable risk factors. An unhealthy diet, let's change what we eat. Physical activity, let's become more physically active, let's exercise. Hypertension, let's get our blood pressure down, let's lose some weight, let's get on the right medications, controlling those two entities, yeah. stabilizes our hypertension. 
excess weight. Again, physical activity, let's get on a diet. Tobacco abuse. It's easy to stop smoking, because I don't smoke. But it's one of the things that we commonly, commonly recommend, stopping smoking, because um, smoking can damage the internal portions of our arteries as well. Abnormal cholesterol, let's get the cholesterol down. Let's take some medications to bring it down. Let's get on a new diet. Let's um, get on some what's called uh, fish oil tablets. Let's work on getting this cholesterol down. And of course, diabetes. Let's get that under control. Let's get the hemoglobin A1C lower than seven. And if lower, awesome. Unfortunately, there are three entities that are not modifiable. Age, um, as we get a little bit older, the risk of developing heart disease is a lot higher, specifically atherosclerotic disease. Gender, males tend to be afflicted with the disease more than females. And of course, family history, genetics. Genetics plays a big role. Um, is it everything? No. Can it be? Can we alter what happens to us? Yes, to a certain degree. Um, unfortunately, some patients who have genetic predisposition to having high levels of cholesterol are at a higher risk for developing atherosclerotic disease and subsequently coronary artery disease. What else can we do? Uh, we can begin a weight loss program. Um, I'm not sure where we have one here in the valley. In San Antonio, we had a uh, bariatric institute where we had different entities to help lose weight, specifically setting weight loss goals and checking them on at regular intervals. Of course, lifestyle changes. Become more active. And the thing is, it's not one person that becomes more active. It has to be a family event. It has to be taken account from the parents to the kids to the neighbors, to the friends. If you see somebody becoming more active, you're like, man, you know, what is he doing? Why does he feel so much better? It's because he's active. He's outside. He's exercising. He's cutting the grass. He's in the lawn. He's uh, tending to the lawn. He's um, uh, in the garden. He's active. She's active. It's contagious. We can improve our diet. Um, we can, of course, quit smoking, limit alcohol, and of course, we can get bariatric surgery. Dining out. It's very, it's, it's actually amazing how many patients tell me, Doc, I just, you know, I can't control my diet because I eat out so much. I'm on the road all the time. I, uh, I work uh, here in Harlingen, and every day I travel 100 miles, and I just, I just can't do it. I, I want to eat out every night. And I'm like, I'm in the same boat, my friend. Last night I had a horrible, horrible meal. I'm not going to tell you what I had but I ate out. And they asked me, well, what can I do if I'm eating out? I'm like, well, multiple restaurants have a special menu, not a special menu, but a special section on the menu that has healthy options, specifically Applebee's, chilies. But even besides that, if you're gonna go to McDonald's or Burger King, they have salads. Last time I checked, the salads at Chick-fil-A were pretty good. I mean, those are, those are just things that are common sense that we can do, we can enact. The other things that we can do, portion control. Limit our portions, okay? Limit them to the amount of fats that we eat, the amount of carbohydrates that we eat, the amount of protein that we eat, and the amount of sugar that we eat. Uh, choose water. Instead of having the sugary drinks, the Cokes, the teas, drink water. No calories, right? Um, take half to go at the beginning. People are like, take half to go. Yes, when you get your meal initially, you tell them, I want to eat half right now and box the rest so I can take it home. If you see, if you only eat what's in front of you, that's half the meal. It's kind of cheating because you're going to go home and maybe you might get into that leftover box. But <laughs> long story short, it's, it's to play a, a trick on your mind. Okay? Split it with a friend. That's the alternative. You can't take home a box. You can't take home a, a, a go box because you split the meal already with your friend. And it's gone. Okay. Go for whole grains. Um, go heavy on the veggies. Order dressings, but ask them to put it on the side. Okay. Um, eat mindfully, and ultimately enjoy the experience. You're dining that. Um, it's a luxury uh, that a lot of people don't get to enjoy, but. Long story short, if you can practice some of these entities, it'll help, it'll go a long ways to losing weight. Now, one thing that I'm really excited about, really excited about is this active Harlingen thing that we started, we are in the process of enacting. 
We have a clinic in um, West Laco on Airport Drive, and every morning I would drive by there, where there once a week, once one week a month. And every morning that you that I would drive by, I would see people outside, active. They have these exercise parks, and those exercise parks, specifically that one, that's the only one I've seen, was always full of people. It didn't matter if I drove by at seven, eight, nine, ten a.m. There was people there from all hours in the morning, and it wasn't young individuals. Sometimes it was, but. Most times, it was people of every age group, from the young to the old, exercising. One day, I was so in awe, like I stopped. You're not supposed to stop in the middle of the street, but I did. And I just paused, and I was amazed, um, blown away, actually. So I called the mayor of uh, Westlake, who happens to be our, one of our patients, and I asked him, how did this happen? How did this come to fruition? And I got some more information. So then, um, he told me that it was uh, part of a, a grant that they had gotten a couple of years ago. And that uh, they've seen a lot of activity, specifically in the parks from elderly, um, from the elderly community, but also from the young community. Why? Because the young community typically goes and exercises, but at the same time, there's a jungle gym and a child park right next door. So they get their exercise in and their kids can go crazy for 45 minutes. And it's perfectly fine because everybody's active. It's all a part of the big contagious um, uh, syndrome that I rec that I talked about earlier. Activity. If you see somebody active, you're going to want to participate. And is that my phone? Oh, Who doesn't want their kids to get tired of the park? That way, when they come home, they're not they don't have as much energy. Um, so. I spoke to a couple of individuals, Matt uh, Wolf, who is the CEO here, and of course, uh, Manny Bell, who's the CEO at um, Valley Baptist. And we got in contact with the mayor of uh, Harlingen. They put me on this, um, this medical board, this health board that the city of Harlingen has, and we're starting to promote a more active lifestyle. Once we see patients in the clinic, we're going to pass out a pamphlet illustrating all the parks that Harlingen has. There's actually six, seven, eight parks. All these parks have these little uh, exercise parks attached to them. They have walking trails. They have bike riding trails. They have they have all these different entities. There's the pamphlet specifically illustrates, I believe, eight parks that have all these activities. They're all free. They're all free. They're open all day long, and the majority of them are open up until the evening. So we're trying to do something different. You know, people ask me, well, how would you do that? It doesn't benefit you to make this society healthier. You're a cardiologist, you're going to make money seeing patients. I'm like, no, it's not about that. I'm from this area, and I want better for the area. I don't want us to come out in the news as the fattest city in the country. Nobody wants that. You want to be number one, but not for that. <laughs> At the end of the day, you want better for the people. You want progress. You want the society to become better. And the only way to do that is to be that driving force, to be that guy on the ground that's pushing them. So for all my patients who um, I see in the clinic who are not very active, I'm like, hey man, this is park that's right next to kind of where you live. I think you should definitely try some physical activity. Granted, if the patients have severe conditions and they're immobile, then I'm not gonna recommend that. But if they can, then I will push the notion of exercise on a regular basis. And people ask, well, how much exercise is enough? Typically anywhere between 15 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, meaning where you're getting your heart rate up. You're going up uh, either stairs or you're going up uh, an escalator, or you, but you're going up the escalator, not it's riding. Or you're going around um, uh, one lap. Typically tends to increase your heart. Anywhere between 60 to 85% of your max predicted heart rate. And you can generate that by doing this crazy calculation, 220 minus your age, gives you that number. Not important. 
the important part is that we want people to become active. The activity also leads to numerous other benefits, specifically mental productivity. Um, the more active you are, the more accomplished you feel at the end of the day. There's multiple weeks where I don't exercise um, and I feel horrible, but that one day that I go to the gym and I come out, I'm like, gosh, I can do anything. And 15, 20 minutes later, I'm so tired, I'm gonna go to sleep. But for that brief moment, that euphoria that kicks in is ideal. Imagine doing it on a daily basis, or even three or four times a week. It's, it, it improves, one, your physical well-being, as well as your mental health. And I believe with that, I conclude. Thank you. I'm going to take a bunch of questions now, okay? Anybody? <laughs> Is it too late to exercise? Is it too late to modify your risk factors? No. no. It's not. By and large, people ask me that all the time. They're like, man, I'm 80. What do I do now? I'm like, well, we're a bit of a conundrum, but it's not the end of the world. Let's put you on the right medications. Let's get you active. Let's get you on a good diet. And by and large, they do very well. Okay. We live at a, an RV park. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have an exercise on a video for 30 minutes. You walk two miles, but it's not hard at all, even for me who's older. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get your heart rate up, and then you come bring it back down. And since I've been doing it, it, I feel a lot better. That's awesome. That's like the best thing I've heard all day long. But I'm thinking of a lot of the other people may live in parks and want to start that kind of a program, too. You can start uh, an exercise group. You get the ladies together. Um, there's a, you can create a Facebook group. You can create a group <coughs> by word of mouth. Anything that stimulates one camaraderie and two physical activity is ideal. Who doesn't want to gossip and walk at the same time, <laughs> right? <laughs> it makes sense, right? right? <coughs> what else, guys? Any other questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, how about uh, sometimes like when we're doing some procedures or something, one will say that they exercise, and yes, after just a little bit, they get shorter breath, and they feel their heart rate going real fast. There's some that say when they bend over or doing something difficult, and they get shorter breath, and they feel their heart is beating. What about those type of patients that yeah. bending over and doing just a little bit of work gets them? That could be an issue. They are probably experiencing what's called bentopnia. When they bend over, they develop a shortness of breath. And the shortness of breath that develops with exertion is also concerning. Furthermore, further complicating the fact, or the issue is that their heart rates are fast. They could have something going on. They could have an underlying cardiac condition. Highly recommend that they see a doctor first before they start um, doing any, running any marathons or getting on the elliptical, okay? That's just, um, Majority of our patients that come in are going to be complaining of something of that sort. Shortness of breath that develops with exertion. It could have you could have a pulmonary cause. You could have a cardiac cause. You could just be physically intolerant, meaning that you haven't exercised in years and you wanted to run three miles yesterday and you couldn't. I couldn't. I can't do that today either. I'm probably gonna. I played basketball the other day and I thought my heart was going to come out of my chest. It was beating so fast, I was like, this is not right. I'm never gonna do this again. I'm not 18 anymore. But clearly it's because I was not conditioned. Doesn't mean that's the case for everybody. It's specific and it should be evaluated. Specifically, if you have all the other issues, the bentopnia, the dyspnea of the exertion and the palpitations, there may be a cardiac issue. Okay. Okay. Quitting smoking is, is always mentioned what about the second hand smoke so for a long time we thought nothing of it but it turns out that that can also increase one your risk for cancer and two your risk for atherosclerotic disease why because in the smoke there's oxygen radicals 
oxygen radicals are inhaled and they can damage the internal portions of our arteries and over time lead to atherosclerotic disease. If I know somebody that smokes, I ask them, if you're gonna smoke, smoke outside, please. For the health of everybody else inside the house, smoke outside. Um, it's a little late after the fact, after somebody has smoked for 30 or 40 years because the damage has been done. But uh, with that being said, those symptoms and oftentimes the conditions that are associated with it can be controlled. Anything else? Now's your chance. Because <laughs> you're gonna go home and be like, golly, I had a bunch of questions. Even if it's not obesity or hypertension or cardiac related, please feel free to ask. At the end of the day, the more knowledge we have, the better we feel. Peace of mind is important as well. Yes, ma'am. Um, if you have that done and everything looks good, do I still have to go see you if I have the palpitations and the chip and the shortness of breath? There's a, there's other causes for the heart screen. Typically, she's referencing what we call a heart score. It's a CT scan of the chest. It measures how much calcium we have in our arteries. Well. The screening test is ideal for individuals typically less than 65 years of age. The problem is, as we get older, our arteries become calcified. We start to develop tissue outside of the heart that also becomes calcified. It's hard to differentiate whether that calcium, the hardening, is on the outside or on the inside of the arteries. I've seen probably 12 patients in the last two weeks who were petrified because they had an abnormal score. Well, we're inclined to do a secondary test and it's often a test to see how the blood flow is actually uh, developing within the coronary arteries from the top to the bottom and into the muscle. And in about 10 of those individuals, it was stone cold normal, stone cold normal. So again, the test is ideal for individuals who are a little bit younger. It's a great screening test. If we see a lot of calcium, we can start modifying our wrists. We can get on what's called uh, a statin, atorvastatin, simvastatin, pravastatin. Or we can possibly get on even ASP, depending on how much calcium we have. But the problem is it, it's hard to differentiate whether the calcium is on the outside or on the inside. It's merely used as a screening test. If the patient, if you're a patient and you're having active symptoms, we're typically not going to recommend that study. That's just the God's honest. We'll recommend something else. Ask me. Go ahead. Why does with some heart patients, uh, like this friend of ours, was told that the top part of his, top part of his heart is bigger than the bottom part of it? And what causes that? Sure. So he, they're referencing a dilated atrium. We have four chambers on our heart, okay? Two top chambers, one on the right side called the right atrium, one on the left side called the left atrium, one on the bottom called the right ventricle, one on the left side called the left ventricle. This is my normal spiel because I pretty much go through it at least four or five times a day. And, and I draw it out for people. I'm not a very good artist. Unfortunately, God did not bless me with the ability to draw. That's okay. We get the point. Four chambers. The top two chambers are very important. Everybody typically worries about the bottom chambers, but the top two chambers are also very important. The atria, okay. The left atrium can become dilated in multiple conditions. Specifically, when the valve in between the atrium, the ventricle, is thickened or becomes floppy. It's called mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. When the valve that leads from the ventricle to the aorta is thickened or floppy, that can also cause the chamber to become dilated. When we're obese, there's a lot of pressure, typically on our heart, and that can also cause that chamber to become dilated. When we have high blood pressure, that can also cause that chamber to become dilated. Multitude of things. Um, once that chamber becomes dilated, you're at risk for what we call arrhythmias, specifically atrial fibrillation fibrillation, abnormal rhythm. Normally, the conduction system of the heart goes from the top to the middle, down to the right ventricle, and then down to the left ventricle, okay? When we have 
atrial fibrillation, that normal electrical activity is disrupted. The chamber, the top chamber, becomes dilated and it starts to disrupt the normal electrical signals. You see, we have this intrinsic electrical activity. It's going to cause our heart to beat millions of times in a 24-hour, 48-hour span. Okay? When we have disruption of that electrical system via arrhythmias, um, we're going to feel it. You're going to feel those symptoms. Why? Because it's not the norm. It's not something that you're used to. You're going to feel palpitations. You're going to feel short of breath. You're going to feel weak, tired. Okay? But it's something that can be controlled. Long story short, that, that electrical system is important because it gives the energy to the cells of the heart so that it can pump. When we have this atrial fibrillation, it disrupts it and it's sending a whole bunch of signals downwards and it's causing our heart rate to, bat to be fast. And by and large, we become symptomatic as a result. Okay, that's the troublesome entity with a dilated atrium. But there's a host of problems that can that can cause it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Mitral valve uh, regurgitation uh, cause pain in your chest. Pain? Um, it can. By and large, most patients become short of breath. Why? Because the fluid that's typically supposed to go from the lungs to the left atrium to the vent left ventricle and then outwards to the rest of the body tends to regurgitate back into the lungs. We have typical symptoms of shortness of breath. Well, when the cells can't get enough oxygen, the cells can't get enough oxygen, it's going to cause a number of issues. Specifically, it can cause chest pain to develop. Okay, Why? Because the blood flow is supposed to come from the top to the ventricle, and then outwards, right? As soon as it comes out of the aorta, as soon as it comes out, there's what's called coronary arteries, right? The one that goes to the right side is called the right coronary artery. The one that goes to the left side is called the left anterior descending coronary artery. I'm sorry, it's called, it goes to the front. The one that goes to the left, left side is called the left circumflex. If those arteries aren't getting enough blood flow, that muscle won't get enough blood flow, and that will produce chest pain. Make sense? Yes, ma'am. Does salt or sodium cause hypertension? Hundred percent. So why? Well, a great question. Somebody really asked that. Can you repeat it? Sure. She asked, "Does salt or excessive salt intake cause high blood pressure, hypertension?" It does. It goes hand in hand. Why? Because salt attracts water. Okay. When we have a lot of salt within our blood vessels, it's gonna bring in more water. It's gonna cause that blood pressure to go up. One of the main things, first and foremost, things that I tell my patients every single time when they get diagnosed with high blood pressure is, we gotta cut the salt out. We gotta switch to Mrs. Dash, okay? Um, the phenomenon is typically illustrated by putting um, a jug, two, two separate jugs, one with salt, and water, the other one without it, and then either using a rag and you have osmosis of the water that goes from one side to the other. The one that has more salt content typically gets the most water. It's a cool experiment that we did as kids. But, um, but yeah, it illustrates the fact that when we have high, um, high blood pressure, it's typically associated with high sodium levels. Cutting the sodium out tends to lower our blood pressure. Anywhere between five to 15 millimeters of mercury for the top number, the systolic number. But it's so, it's so important, super important. And Mrs. Dash isn't that bad. I had a meal the other day with Mrs. Dash. <laughs> it's probably the last meal I'll have, Mrs. Dash. <laughs> but it wasn't that bad, it wasn't that bad. Any, yes ma'am. What is leakage of the valve? Leakage of the valve is when it's floppy or regurgitated, <clears throat> meaning that the valve regurgitates fluid backwards. In the, in the setting of the mitral valve, the fluid goes backwards into the atrium and into the lungs. In terms of the aortic valve, the fluid tends to build up backwards inside of the ventricle. Um, the tricuspid valve, which is on the right side, tends to build, the fluid builds up backwards. 
and it typically builds up in the body. Because okay, the when we have blood flow, remember we have arteries that take blood downwards, right? And veins that bring blood back up to the right side of the heart. Well, the tricuspid valve is on the right side of the heart and it accepts all that blood from the rest of the body. When it's leaky, blood tends to pull backwards, specifically in the legs, in our upper extremities. That's when we have a lot of edema. Does it mean 100% that that's the primary cause? No. But it's a common um, symptom that we see associated with it. So, by and large, a leaky valve is when the valve regurgitates blood backwards. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Facebook tie-in snoring with heart disease. Snoring? So we referenced it Not as sleep apnea, because she said it's snoring. It's just snoring. It's never been tested for sleep apnea. Snoring. So it's really important. People typically um, do they do they have a partner? Yes, the partner we're talking about. Part, yeah. <laughs> the, the 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 I want the partner to when she notices the patient snoring, I want him I want her to watch that partner. I want her to watch him, I guess in essence in this case. Why? Because when they're snoring excessively, there's going to be likely moments where they don't breathe. And that, in essence, is, a, is attributed to uh, sleep apnea. Can you have it 100% of the time? No. Sometimes it's associated with a deviated septum or a nasal pharyngeal abnormality. That's, how does that affect the heart is what she's wondering? The snoring? Yeah. Well, if it's attributed to sleep apnea, well, there's going to be episodes where you stop breathing and your heart doesn't get enough um, oxygen with blood flow. As a result, you're gonna develop arrhythmias. You specifically, atrial fibrillation. Um, you can develop what's called bradyarrhythmias, where your heart goes too slow. Um, by and large, when we see patients who have sleep apnea or who have excessive snoring, we often recommend, recommend that they undergo a sleep study. That's like, um, it goes hand in hand. Hand in hand. One thing that she can try is try sleeping on, on their side. Um, that tends to help improve the snoring. Furthermore, it causes them to snore away from the partner so that they don't. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. <coughs> Earplugs help too. But if they truly have snoring, then there may be a condition that they should worry about. It's it's important to investigate. As one patient I had last week, I, he was real hesitant to go get a sleep study. He was like, God, man, I don't want people to watch me sleep. I'm like, your wife watches you sleep all the time. Every time you wake her up, she's watching you. And she, I'm sure she's cussing at you and she wants to hit you, but she doesn't. These guys are just going to be monitoring. Nobody's going to want to hit you. This is their job. And he's like, all right. So he goes and he undergoes his study and for sure he has sleep apnea. And they put him on a little machine, a uh, CPAP. Mm -hmm. And he, I just so happened to see him um, about two days after he started using it. He was like, he looked like a different person. He was like, oh my God, I feel so much better. I feel like a different person. I, I woke up and I feel like I finally slept. I feel like I, I hadn't slept in years. And you have, I have so much energy. I'm not taking 20 naps during the day. I can finish all my work without any problems. I'm like, man, good for you. And I was like, furthermore, my wife doesn't want to hit me. <laughs> and I told him good. Yes, ma'am. I just, I have a 50 year old son who has elevated cholesterol, and the doctor um, that he's gone to see has prescribed an ACE inhibitor. Sure. Is that? I never heard of that. I just heard sure, it sure. happens. Not a problem. An ACE inhibitor is specifically a blood pressure medication. Oh. He likely has um, a component of high blood pressure also. An ACE inhibitor is um, ideal in controlling blood pressure. It's real protective and it's cardioprotective. Oh, okay. When we lower our blood pressure, we decrease the force that the heart has to pump against. Over time, if the heart has to pump against very high pressures, it can weaken it, it can damage it. So by lowering the blood pressure, it helps alleviate or prevent those issues from developing in the future. Okay. Make sense? Thank you, yes. Of course. Okay. Who else? Yes, ma'am. Can you explain the difference between what men feel with a heart attack and women feel 
No, man, that's a great question. It's a very. Uh, I mean, you don't have to. No, 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 no. Um, no, but yeah, that's very, very, um, a very good question. So when uh, angina was initially described in the 1800s, they described this phenomenon that happens um, typically when we exert ourselves. We feel either pressure, tightness, somebody squeezing our chest. It happens with exertion. Um, it can also happen after we eat. Why? Because when we eat, the blood that's typically going to our heart at high levels is pushed to our stomach. Because our stomach's working very hard, it's trying to digest everything that we have. If we have blockages, we're going to limit the amount of blood flow going to our heart so we can develop symptoms afterwards. Okay. Now, these symptoms typically, um, uh, the pressure is described anywhere between 4, 5, 6 out of 10 in intensity. The symptoms typically last anywhere between three to five minutes, somewhere in that time frame, and they typically resolve with rest. Well, Diamond and Forrester illustrated this exact same finding in the 1970s, um, but they predominantly identified this in men. Well, the issue is that women typically present atypically. They don't present with the normal um, symptoms that develop when you are exerters, when you exert yourself. They tend to develop more with abdominal symptoms. The symptoms are, are often missed because um, they mistake them for being some type of GI related issue. It happens also with exertion where you feel this abdominal pain, nausea, you start <coughs> sweating, you feel your heart racing. Um, those symptoms have to be looked at a little bit further. Sometimes you can develop Chest, the typical chest pain. But by and large, there's going to be um, a lot of patients who don't present like that. The other complicating factor is diabetes. Unfortunately, when we, high, when we have high glucose levels, it damages the nerves okay, in our body. So we don't feel the same chest pain that everybody else feels. Sometimes it's going to be abdominal pain. It's going to be nausea. It's going to be this feeling like you want to vomit. Um, it's going to be where you're having these cold chilling spells, you're so hot, you're sweaty, you're clammy, there's an issue going on. That's by and large how they present. They can also have dizziness and feelings that they're gonna pass out when they're exerting themselves or you know after they eat. Okay? Of course. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Robert. Of course, thank you guys. And if you guys have more questions, Dr. Yarley, my partner, will be here next week. You can definitely ask me. Yeah. <laughs> Tell him that I specifically sent you. Thank you all. You all have been wonderful. You guys Thank have you. a great night. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosetta. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Before we go, we're going to do a couple of door prizes. Woo. We actually